Citizen Planet tonight, we sat down with Kenya's environmental royalty, if you will. That's right. Wanjira Madai, daughter of Wangari Madai, environmentalist and Nobel Peace Prize laureate. And she spoke to us about her billion-dollar assignment by the Bezos Earth Fund and her climate action wish list for the continent. I started by asking her whether the Nairobi declaration from the Africa Climate Summit was Africa's silver bullet in finally seeing rich nations pay for the damaging climate impact inflicted on Africa. Did they get it right? I think they got a lot right. And there's a lot there that could be clearer. But you don't expect all of that to be in the declaration. We have to then go to the different levels and, and interrogate. Urgent action is needed, especially by the highest emitters, who have done the most to cause this mess and really have not delivered much. The Global Stock Tick report came out and the synthesis shows not so good. So there's a lot more action needed to reduce emissions. But we can't wait for that. We have to also move. That's why the climate justice movement, I say, is alive and well. We need it because we have to keep putting pressure, not only on commitments, because commitments are easy to break. We need to track action. What's actually being done to bring emissions down? There needs to be more seriousness around fossil fuels. We know that's the biggest driver of emissions. How do we make sure that those are moving in the right direction? So that side, the other reality that is true is that we are sitting at a time at the confluence of issues that actually are at our advantage. The fastest growing and the youngest workforce in the world. The largest renewable energy potential anywhere, 60% of the best solar potential is found here on the continent. But yet only less than 1% of investments in renewable energy come to the continent. That's not right and that's not fair. And then of course we also have, we happen to have an abundance of critical minerals that are needed. That is amazing for us. We also have the largest restoration potential in the world. That means as restoration is happening, we could create green quality jobs. So we're looking ahead to the UN General Assembly COP28. What do you anticipate to bring to the table there? You talked about big emitters being held accountable. How do we ensure that those are not missed moments? Well, there needs to be a continued pressure from the multilateral system. You know, the multilateral system, Victoria is based on trust, right? So, and that's all we have. We have that platform where we have equal voice and we trust that what you say, you will do. We have to, otherwise what's left, right? So that those systems have to continue to hold um, the biggest emitters to account. The global stock take is exactly that. It's bringing, it's taking stock of how are we doing so far? Not so good. So let's see, accountability structures are lacking. We don't have, so what you gonna do if I'm not meeting my obligations? That's where we have a lot more work. My, my opinion is that everybody knows the time is short. We have to deliver on this. And so we get closer and closer to that. I hope that the spirit of Ubuntu holds right? We are, what am I if you are not? And we saw that with COVID. Nobody is free until everybody is free. If we have a situation where people are suffering in one part of the world, it is everybody's business. And we know we can prevent it. The science has gotten clearer and clearer, sharper and sharper. We know that we can now attribute situations, fires and droughts and floods to climate change. We have got to make sure that people hold their part of the bargain. Oftentimes, climate change issues, Wanjira, are very complex. How do we ensure those people on the ground who oftentimes suffer the worst effects of climate change become owners of this agenda, have a sense of agency? Well, I think that's one of the most important things, and that's why adaptation, you hear adaptation, especially locally-led adaptation, is such an important part of this agenda, right? So communities is ensuring that they have enough food, that they're planting crops that are, uh, farmers are planting crops that are suited for that climate. A rediscovery of traditional knowledge systems that actually were suited to the climate the foods at that time suited to what was happening, we're seeing a revival of that because and not only were they more nutritious and created lasting resilience, they were also 
resilient to to the climatic conditions so all of those adaptive capacities so building more adaptation strategies at the community level and therefore investing and part of a wonderful initiative called restore local that is investing a hundred million dollars into locally led restoration looking at local entrepreneurship young people going into tree-based businesses nursery development because one of the most important limiting factors of restoration is planting material you hear that all the time government wants to plant a hundred thousand trees where are those seedlings we don't know so getting young people and and entrepreneurs into that sector so providing acceleration support providing loans providing grants so that that um, those businesses are advanced and then of course incentivizing uh, farmers to grow and restore landscapes and engage in restoration through organizations like Arcos in Rwanda, Greenport here, the Greenbelt movement, all of those incentivizing more and more expanding of those sorts of grassroots initiative. Half of the resources, $50 million, is destined to the community. So I cannot wait to see that triggered because we also know economics matter. If I can put money in the hands of people, they will build lasting resilience. They'll buy what they need. They will build more resilient homes. They will live in less vulnerable situations. So we've got to see economic empowerment as part of building resilience. We have a great opportunity because imagine this, the infrastructure that's needed for Africa in the next 50 years has not yet been built. Earlier this year, Wanjira was selected to be the Africa advisor for the Bezos Earth Fund worth $10 billion, or roughly 1.4 trillion shillings. It is a grand commitment to be dispersed by 2030 worldwide. Uh, the Bezos Earth Fund has committed a billion dollars to restoration on the continent, probably another similar amount to conservation, so conservation of forests like the Congo Basin and more even to other parts of the world. But for Africa at least, it's ensuring that those investments are made thoughtfully, they're made in a way that doesn't overwhelm and kill the organizations because sometimes we know too much money comes and it comes at the wrong time. So I love that the Bezos Earth Fund is building the capacity of the organizations they're investing in. So saying that not only do we want to invest in you, we want to invest in your capacity to thrive and grow and attract more resources. Let not this be the only stream. If this is a stream of income, hopefully next time you have three times more by the time this grant is finished. So there's a sense of how we build up and, and build up the strength of local institutions. Because the Bezos Earth Fund is very clear that the work will really be done by local organizations. So that's important. And of course, investing in the protection of critical landscapes like the Congo Basin, um, and, and again, even in that case, building circles of local uh, leadership is very much a part of that. So I, I'm really happy that that's become a big part of their way of working. So, you know, we walk around Nairobi all over this country and we see your mother's legacy. You know, for you as Wanjira, how would you want to extend that? And what do you have hope for? Well, I think that the thing that most gives me hope, Victoria, is, is just how inspiring young people are. You look at young Kenyans, young Ugandans, the activists who have refused to acquiesce to, to the status quo. They're saying their life, they will be the ones who face the worst impacts of, the, of climate change. They will be the ones who live with the impacts we read about. And therefore, they demand space. They demand to be heard. And if you look at what has happened in the last 10 years, uh, they are doing more as 18, 19, and 20 year olds than we could ever have imagined ourselves. So I'm inspired, and that's why we set up the Wangari Mathai Foundation, focused on youth engagement, saying that they need to start getting involved early. So it actually starts with children, and then children become youth, and youth become young adults, and those young adults are the ones who go into elective office. You hope. By the time they go into electoral office, the, the Minister for Environment, we always rely on, thank goodness, the good ones we have. But you hope that it will always be that way. You can't guarantee. But if young people enter spaces like of politics with that consciousness, you know we will be okay. So I'm inspired greatly by 
the youth leadership that we are seeing from Africa and of course proudly from Kenya.